what I'd like to do is to begin, I'd like to share with you how, how the Tibetan has laid out the whole human kingdom and tried to share with us a broad way of looking at what are the groupings of people and how are there, what is the, these groupings are based simply upon states of consciousness. These are not groupings based upon um, um, any kind of hierarchical authority. It's simply people are at different places on the path, different levels of awareness. And so he's taken and, and um, that's fine. And he's taken, um, he's taken it and broken it down. So let's take a look at this. The first is, uh, the first has a, um, uh, what he would call the masses, just the masses. And we're talking about the, the masses in the biggest sense, where you're thinking about the masses in third world countries. Uh, we're thinking about, essentially, he, he would refer to them as people that by and large are illiterate, that they are people that, um, they have very little cultural advantage in their circumstances. They um, are people that uh, s struggle just to survive in many ways. And there is, there is nothing in their, um, um, let's put it this way, because of the circumstances of their lives, they can be easily standardized. In other words, it's, it's a grouping, it's a large number of people that are swayed by the by public opinion, they're swayed by um, um, survival issues. And in many ways, it's a group of people that can, in the, in the end, can be, um, they can fall prey to autocratic leadership who promise a, a solution, but often are manipulated wrongly in that. Off, these, these are people that are very young on the path and are, their consciousness is um, it's very innocent. It's innocent. But there's a lot of fear. Just survival fear is part of that group. Large group. The second, the Tibetan calls the average good people of the world. The average good people of the world. Uh, the bourgeois. He says that basically the bourgeois, the, 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 this group is actually the largest group uh, when it comes to modern society, Western society, um, other than the most third world countries. Uh, the, the, when we talk about more educated humanity, this is the largest aspect of educated humanity or relatively educated humanity. Intelligent, diligent, often religious, uh, often religious people that are also um, sometimes uh, can be quite sectarian and have a, have a, a strong sort of um, uh, a narrowing perspective of ideals. It's a group of people that really have a tendency towards strong partisanship, aligning with this uh, this view against this view. So it's, it, there's a lot of identification with ideologies and, and, and a tendency to, uh, to align with one ideology in opposition to another. Often this group is very interested in choosing leaders from their, their ranks uh, that they believe will, will kind of stand for their cause. And this is, you can see this in our politics, we see this all around. Um, they're, most they're the most powerful element in, our, in the nation, any nation, really. Um, and um, um, there's, a, there's a kind of diligence to this group of people. But fundamentally, there's a goodness there, a goodness. There's, a, there's an opening. The heart is, is opening. They're driven by ideals. They yearn for justice, and they long for peace. They long for peace. So the Tibetan puts that group as the second group. The third group he calls the intelligentsia of the world, the intelligentsia. Here he's talking about the, the as you might guess from the title, people that are even uh, more, uh, um, more educated, 
but also more powerfully influential. Their, their tendency is to influence the leaders who come out of the bourgeois. Their tendency is to shape public opinion. These are the people that are often, um, they, they are the formulators of ideas that then get translated into ideals. They're people that, um, they stir up the, the bourgeois. They influence large world affairs. These are people that, um, that assume a lot of responsibility, either selfishly or unselfishly. There's a lot of people in this group that are quite egotistical and selfish, and there are many people in this group that are actually quite uh, compassionately focused on the welfare of, of others as well. So it's not, this is not a judgment of positive or negative. It's just a group of people and the state of their way of looking at life and their consciousness. These are people that um, um, are found in all organizations, and through, the, through, the, through them, the middle class is, is reached. Um, yeah, so that group, uh, and because society is becoming more, and ed more educated, there's, uh, you know, compared to how we were uh, 500 years ago in terms of educational opportunities and learning, this group is also growing, also growing. And the fourth group is the group that the Tibetan calls the new group of world servers. So the fourth group is the group that we're discussing today. And the new group of world servers, he says, basically, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, they're, they're, it's a group of people that unknowingly are beginning to form a new social order. But it's not based upon an organization. One of the things that's so important about this emerging group is that it's not an organization. It's an organism. In fact, the Tibetan recommends that it never should be ever viewed as an organization. Um, because if it becomes an organization, it becomes crystallized, and it'll go into the rigidity of organization, which is going to be as, have a real negative. So seeing it as a living organism in society is what is, is viewed here. These are people that belong to no um, party or government, at least in the partisan sense. This is really important. The earlier groups had a tendency towards strong partisanship, aligning with this view in opposition to this view. The new group of world servers, it is recommended that they move away from partisan thinking because partisan thinking tends to be divisive. It points, it, it pushes, it, it says this is right and this is wrong. It's, it's, um, and there's, it's, it's this idea that you see, the new group of world servers, its purpose is to be a bridge between opposite points of view, not, a, not, not being completely identified with one or the other. Each group, new, the group, new group of world servers is a group that's trying to synthesize the threads of truth found in all partisan attitudes. And it tries to recognize that all partisan perspectives have elements of truth and distortion in them. It's not about this, these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. This is the right attitude and this is the wrong attitude. It's about what is the relationship of darkness and lightness in this perspective versus what is the relationship of darkness and lightness here. And in that kind of relativity of weighing, decisions can be made. So it's, 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 a, it's not about standing for some political cause or social cause. It's about realizing that every cause and every one has something to give, but also has distortion in the picture. You've heard me say this before, that no one has found the truth, but everybody has found a piece of it. No religion has found the truth, but every religion has found a piece of it. No ideological partisan attitude has found the truth, but it has a piece of the truth. And that's the general underlying assumption that the new group of world servers is slowly evolving to become, or to be attending to. Um, it, it actually views partisan conflict as an approach to problem solving that is now outdated. It's time to leave that kind of, kind of perspective and move to the next level of decision making. And the only way that can be done is if we start to adopt the notion that, as I just said, 
no attitude, no person, no institution has the truth, but only a piece of it. Changes the world entirely. Imagine what the world would be like. Imagine what the world would be like if everybody held that view. Oh my goodness, it would be a different world. It would truly be a different world. It tempers ego. It diminishes the ego tendency, which is so partisanly based, and it brings us into a more understanding of holistic perspective. So this, this is a very important concept to keep in mind. Um, essentially, the new group of world servers is, is a group of people that, um, how to put this, if, if, there was, if, you, if you had to look at them from as a, you know, like a platform, um, by platform I mean like, you know, a politician might have a platform, they stand on this principle, this is their platform. So what is the, the most essential platform for the new group of world servers? It's, it's to stand on the principle of humanity's essential divinity. That's the most fundamental platform, that every human being is at the core divine. Every human, humanity itself is an outpicturing of the greater life. That's the platform that is the, you might say, the most fundamental assumption held by this group. And from that, all other things arise in, in terms of perspective, perspective. Are you all with me? So, you still with me? Okay. I think what I'll do is I want to show you a graphic, and it's ap I think it's actually a graphic that you two have in your packet. Does everybody have your, you have the handouts? Okay, great. Just to, let's just take a look at something here. And it, as I say, you have this in your system, your packet as well. But what we're trying to see here is we're trying to recognize the, the, the structure that I just shared with you. As you can see by the graphic here that we have at the highest point, we have the hierarchy in the seven ashrams, which I'll talk about in a little bit. The hierarchy in the seven ashrams. I touched on it last night. But then we have the whole of humanity, and here it's depicted in this model as a, a, a pyramid. And that here we have the, the masses, the average good people, the intelligentsia. But we also have the new group of world servers. But look at where, what, what I've tried to do with this image is to try to give you a sense of their placement they're the great middle link. It is said that the new group of world servers is a bridge, not just between oppositional creeds that are horizontal, but also vertically. They're a bridge between the hierarchy of masters and humanity as a whole. They're bridges. They're, they're the mediating force. That's the idea here. That's the idea. And notice what I've done on this is I've tried to highlight the idea that, as you can see, the new group of world servers how are they influenced by intuitive impressions coming from above? That, that, that the hierarchy speaks through buddhi. Buddhi. Buddhi is the word in Hinduism for pure, pure divine intuition. And that intuition is absolutely formless. But it's designed to, be, to precipitate through a disciple's causal body. The causal body, for you and each of us, the causal body is your container of acquired wisdom over hundreds of lives. So we've got this incredibly subtle quality of intuition that is said to be 100% impersonal. Impersonal. Keep in mind, this is not the kind of intuition that we typically think of. This, that's often a high-level feeling state. This is this is a, a very much more subtle than that. And that intuition tries to funnel itself through a disciple's causal body, which is your body of acquired wisdom. And through that, this impersonal con concept or this impersonal intuition is given a coloring that, that is based upon your acquired wisdom. So it's impersonal wisdom being 
qualified, you might say, with your acquired wisdom. And then, then that's what becomes the inspiration to lead ultimately to outer action. So that's the, that's the story here. This, this is the position. And then, so it starts as intuitive recognition. And then, as you can see, the new group of world servers then dis radiates it downward through ideations, ideas that are formulated from those impressions. So this is all about divine thought form building. You know, my book is about this, and many of you have been to some workshops where I've focused on the subject of magic. This is what this is about, magic, the art of magic, which is also called the art of thought form building. That's what this is, this is what service really is. How do we translate formless intuitions coming forth from the ashram? How do we build ideations from those formless intuitions? And then how do we effectively carry it into the intelligentsia and bring it into the, 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 the tears of humanity that I've denoted here? That's, that's the goal. That's the goal. So it's, and it's all based upon this platform of essential divinity to stand upon and the platform that also says it's all about goodwill. Goodwill. Ooh, and we're going to look at the subject of goodwill a bit later as well. Okay. Now, are there any questions at this point that you'd like to ask? Ma ma magic is the process of thought form building. The question is, um, she's asking, what was it that I just said? She wanted to clarify that terminology. And I was trying to say that when we talk about magic in this philosophy, we're talking about the art of thought form building. That's actually another name for the art of magic, is the art of thought form building. See, it's not magic as in hocus pocus. There, I guarantee you there are no magic wands or flying carpets in this at all. It's the amazing process of taking something that's intuitive and formless and making it form and bringing it and delivering it. It's to, it's to bring forth good ideas. Manifest. Manifest good ideas. First, the, the first manifestation of it is idea. Later, it takes on an emotional coloring to add richness to the idea. And finally, it's about finding a way of delivering that idea into the outer world. It steps, it's, it, and that's the art of magic, is the process of stepping it through. And as I say in the, my, on my own book, every human soul is destined to become a magician. Because every human soul is a member of the new group of world servers. And every human soul is def, destined to br be a creative agent on behalf of the greater life. It's in, it, it's, it's in the nature of evolution itself that that must be so. That must be so. But of course, don't think of the word creativity in a very narrow way. Think of it in a really, really wide way. Every one of us is creative or potentially creative. So that's what this is really about. That's what this is about.